Welcome to My Business Matters, the Michigan Chamber podcast. Welcome and thanks for listening. I'm Jim Holcomb, President and CEO of the Michigan Chamber. And today we're going to be talking about everybody's favorite topic, especially as we get into uh, summer driving season, fixing the roads and bridges in Michigan. But we're going to be tackling one of the key challenges right now that may not be as well understood, and that's the aggregates and the cost and supply issues that kind of surround that. We're joined by two experts today who are focused on this industry. They work every day on these issues. They'll help us break down what's happening, why it's happening, and how we can ensure a bipartisan fix here from Lansing. We have Doug Needham, the Executive Director of the Michigan Aggregates Association. Welcome, Doug. And Kelly Kuyper, she holds kind of a unique perspective, sitting in two seats. She's the Director of Business Development for Great Lakes Excavating Services, and she's also a Georgetown Township Planning Commissioner in Ottawa County. Welcome. Welcome, thanks. Well, policymakers, politicians, media, the general public, we're all discussing infrastructure all the time, it seems like, and, and what Michigan should be doing to improve. But despite all the talk, I still don't think many people have a full picture just of what really is going on in terms of raw materials and what we're going to need to achieve even our most modest goals. Doug, can you kind of give listeners a better understanding of the definition of aggregates and why they're so important? Uh, sure, Jim. Uh, again, thanks for having the opportunity to give me the opportunity to be here today. Uh, great question. What is aggregate? We hear that quite a bit. And, and it is the sand, the gravel, the crushed stone, the recycled aggregate that is the basic building blocks that's used for various construction projects. We use it for our roads, our bridges, uh, factories, distribution centers, but also our homes in our bridges, or I mean in our basements, in our driveways and sidewalks. So it is the building block uh, of Michigan. It makes up about 95% of asphalt and 85% of concrete. So aggregate rocks build Michigan. Yeah, and so what I'm here to say too, it's not just the roads and bridges, it's all of our building materials. Right. And are there different grades and sizes or is it just all is one and you kind of get it and use what you have? No, nope, but a, a construction grade aggregate has to have specific characteristics uh, and physical properties in order to be used. Uh, a ro uh, stone has to have good durability if it's gonna be used in our road surface so that when it gets wet, uh, we have the ability to stop and we just don't slide. Mm -hmm. uh, stones have to have a good quality so in the winter, they don't pop and blow our roads and bridges apart uh, with the freeze thaw that we have here in Michigan. So just because you see stones and, and sand does not make it construction grade material. It actually has to have this specific material characteristic. So there's a lot of science still behind all of this when you, I kind of think about it's kind of like a cake mix. You have a certain recipe and you get this cake with this recipe. Absolutely. We want our roads and bridges and our buildings to last. We, we live in a pretty harsh uh, environment with our freeze thaw. So uh, we want to make sure that we have the best materials that's used in the construction uh, of those infrastructure. Right. Kelly, from an industry perspective, what are some of the challenges you're seeing right now or what are you dealing with out in the real world as a, a lot of people would say? Right, right. Really, I think the ultimate issue that I experience uh, as an applicant um, is a lack of consistency across the board. So one community doesn't have a mining ordinance. The next community, um, potentially reasonable to work with. The next community is putting on a moratorium as soon as they hear the word or, or mention that an applicant is coming uh, with a mining project. And so really it's this lack of consistency um, that's causing my business to experience um, delays. Uh, I am experiencing financial constraints just with all the added reports and applications that well exceed the authority of these local units. Um, but really, I, I can't predict what I'm going to experience at a local unit. And that's the most frustrating part. So you're getting a patchwork of regulations across the state where you have to go municipal, municipality to municipality and try to figure out what they want. Correct. And that's not necessarily unique. You know, each, each local unit has their own zoning ordinance and there's nuances to those ordinances, but it's more than that. It's that they're exceeding their authority by requiring reports um, and different analysis that aren't listed in the ordinance. And they're really doing it under the guise of the planning commission has the authority to request whatever they need to make an informed decision. But as an applicant, I have to go and prepare my site plans based on that list of criteria in the ordinance. And when that's not the actual list of criteria that I'm being held to, I can't do my job well. 
Doug, your members in the association, how often are they having to uh, go in to a local uh, unit of government to kind of ask for a permit, isn't it? They have the land, you just start digging and away you go? Oh no, Every, before we put a shovel in the ground, we do have to go to the local township right now in order to get a permit to mine the material that's on our land. Mm -hmm. um, and that's where the resistance is coming. And what's our status right now in Michigan, kind of current lay of the land? Do we have enough material? Do we not? Is this a forward-looking issue where people are trying to deal with something that's going to happen 10, 20 years down the road, or do we have a problem right now? So we are blessed with fantastic material in this state. Uh, as the glaciers receded uh, thousands of years ago, they left these nice deposits of construction-grade sand and gravel. The problem is, is we're having issues getting access to it. So we may know where it is at certain locations. We go to the local townships, as Kelly has said. Uh, we say we would like to, to mine the material on our land so that we can provide it for the infrastructure projects. And the communities are putting up a lot of roadblocks. Uh, delay tactics, denials uh, is very, very common uh, throughout the entire industry right now. But we only need to go when the material that we're mining in the location is being depleted. And unfortunately, that's happening at a very rapid pace right now. So our infrastructure, as you know, ACEC put out, our uh, ASCE put out an infrastructure report for Michigan uh, last week, gave our infrastructure a C minus, our roads are a D, bridges a D plus. You know, the governor is doing all she can to try to help fix our crumbling infrastructure. We have a, a you know, three and a half billion dollar bond program uh, that we're working our way through. So the demand is extremely high right now. But it unfortunately comes at the cost of, um, at the same time, I guess, as the locals are having uh, these traveling um, activists <laughs> that go around the state and they actually really enjoy uh, helping communities deny permit applications that are being submitted for the basic raw material that we need in an everyday life. Uh, as I say, this, this material, we just can't go mine it anywhere. We have to mine it where Mother Nature laid it. And unfortunately, it has been laid in some of these communities that are really putting up a lot of resistance. Kelly, what happens when a local does deny? Like one, I guess the first question is, how do you know where it is, the material is? And then two, if they deny it, what do you do next? Right, I mean, we do a lot of legwork um, in terms of locating our sites. So there's a lot that goes into it in terms of um, not just reviewing geotech and soil borings to understand the material that's there, but part of my job is also to understand the local laws and regulations that are going to govern the site. That, informs our ability to purchase a property. Um, but ultimately, even before uh, a community denies um, a project, I have a, a sense that it will potentially be <laughs> denied. If you've ever been to a planning commission meeting, which most people don't, they can go their entire life without setting foot into a local uh, public meeting. And that's probably a good thing. Probably you can avoid a good it. thing. Um, but you know, these, these local meetings, they send out um, a mailer and the mailer has no information. A special land use is coming within 300 feet of your property. And it's almost designed to rile up the neighbors. Mm -hmm. And you get these local uh, halls packed with 50 to 100 people who go in with assumptions about our project. They know none of the details. And these public comments range from, am I the wife of the owner of the property? What right do I have to be here? Questioning the, the credibility of the environmental reports that we have. And it's really all across the board. And the planning commissioners get so flustered at these angry groups of residents. Well, they're just volunteer public servants. Exactly, all volunteer. Um, and they fail to recognize the public comments aren't actually critiquing my plan against any of their ordinance requirements. It's just angry residents, you know, yelling and talking. But that's where they're, that's where they feel connected to. They just feel like they cannot go against this angry group of residents, even if my plan meets all of the checklist requirements. So you're getting a lot of the NIMBY, the not in my backyard type crowd yes. that comes out. Now, are they organized? Are these truly like organic to a local uh, municipality or do we have people kind of going around pot stirring across the state? Yeah, Doug mentioned we do, there is a group of, of, of activists that are kind of traveling a bit, but more than anything, we're seeing, you know, these, the uh, local Facebook activists, if you will, many communities have their local information pages and, and they start, you know, uh, 
labeling us as, as something we're not or talking about misinformation. And all of a sudden, it gets so far down the line where it's not accurate at all. But everybody comes into that meeting full of rage. Well, it's it's on the Internet. It must be true. It's Facebook right. and Twitter. Right. There's, there's nothing right. misleading out there on that. So what what's the solution? If we have a problem, we need to get more of the aggregates out of the ground. We want to make sure we're building our infrastructure. We want to make sure we have it for the other um, building uses in Michigan. How do we resolve this problem? Well, oh, and that's the solution at hand right now uh, in front of the House Regulatory Reform Committee. Mm -hmm. um, House Bill 4526, 4527, and 4528 were introduced last week. And uh, what it does is it puts the permitting process into the hands of the environmental experts at Eagle. Mm -hmm. uh, we believe that's the solution because they are impartial. Uh, they will look at all the merits of the application to make sure that the environment is being protected, that the local communities do have an input uh, and they do have a voice throughout this process. Uh, they're going to make sure that the land, when it is done, is going to be reclaimed back to a usable condition um, so that we don't have eyesores uh, as many older operations have been left. Uh, a lot of our members are trying to go out there and reopen those uh, to finish the mining and then to reclaim them back to a usable uh, part of the community. What, if, what would be an example of a usable part of the community? How do you reclaim uh, a mine? So throughout Michigan, we've got a lot of little lakes, inland lakes. Uh, subdivisions have grown up around those. So if we're going to be mining uh, in that area has uh, a higher water table, we will create a beautiful inland lake uh, that becomes a staple of the community. It can be either in a subdivision or a park. A lot of golf courses are the uh, remnants of the sand and gravel operation. Farmland uh, certainly can be horse trails. So it, it really depends on the situation and where it's at. But what this bill does is say, however that land is going to be reclaimed, it has to go back to the local community and it has to fit into their master plan. So when the mining is complete, it must be reclaimed. And it, again, there's a spot where the local community has a say as far as what's going to be taking place. Uh, you said the legislation was introduced last week. Is this a new issue for Michigan? Have we seen it before? Has it been introduced in previous sessions? This is about the sixth year we're working on this issue. Uh, definitely taken way too long. And what that has done is throughout this time, since we've been working to try to address this issue, operations have diminished their material. They are not being able to provide the, as what we talked about, construction grade material close to the markets. And that's requiring us to truck it from a lot further away than what we did even six years ago. Uh, we have a number of construction projects that are fed by material that is over 100 miles away. And trucking costs right now are astronomical. You know, the price of fuel has jumped. Uh, it's really hard to get truck drivers, first of all, uh, into the industry. Uh, but that has added a significant cost to construction projects and certainly hampers the taxpayer dollars as we go through uh, to fix our, our roads. And that's just the public infrastructure. We also have a lot of private development that is taking place. As I said, factories, distribution centers, you know, we want to attract businesses and industries into Michigan. And when they look at that and say, well, geez, that's a great idea. However, how am I going to build the facility that I need if there's no material nearby. What's the cost to the taxpayer? You know, you talk about there's increased costs for transportation. What's that doing to the final cost of a project, say if we're building a mile of road and you're having to go through these extraordinary steps just to get materials you need? Yep. yep. And and that's a good depending on the situation and where we're at, I mean we are adding millions of dollars to that construct the just the MDOT construction program alone every year by just the sheer fact that we are traveling 30 miles further, 60 miles further, 100 miles further than what we have in the past. So those miles add up really quick. And by the way, we're also putting more trucks on the road, which is causing more of a delay, more of an impact. Uh, the better we can do is to get the material mined and processed closer to the needs, the better it is for all parties of Michigan. Yeah, it sounds like taxpayers would do a lot better if we could pass this. Absolutely. Kelly, what's, what happens to the industry if we can't get something passed? It fails. I, I mean, there's no better way to say it. I don't know 
I don't know how we survive and and outside of the roads and the bridges, I mean, obviously that's a critical part of this issue, but we talked at the beginning about some of the smaller scale projects, single family home building and utility construction. I mean, these are all also critical needs that require this material. I mean, Michigan has such a robust single family home building industry. Uh, to see that all go away over something that's so easily fixable, to move this uh, you know, entitlement process from this local unit that does not have the experience, knowledge, and understanding of the nuances of mining, moving it to the state that has that level of experience and scientific understanding of mining, getting it to that appropriate authority to keep things moving along just seems so logical. It's, it's hard to wrap your head around how there's so much pushback. Yeah, Doug, are, does Eagle, um, do they currently handle other industries this way? Where are there other industries we can point to that it's not a patchwork, you know, municipality, but municipality, but actually there's one unified standard and everybody in the state's gonna have to live and play by the same rules. Absolutely, there, there are other extractive industries that get their permits through Eagle, oil, gas, uh, the metallic mining, so the nickels, uh, the copper. Also, oh, other mines are already doing it. They are doing it. Similar to right. this. So what we are looking to do is to be in line with them. Uh, it, this natural resource is a statewide uh, resource. We need it all across. It's not just focused if it's located in, in this township. It stays in that township. Absolutely not. We need it to rebuild the I-96s, the I-75s, 275s, the Gordie Howe International mm -hmm. Bridge. We're going to need that material to build our infrastructure so that it benefits all residents uh, of our state. And that's really where uh, the problem comes in play. As we have our conversation today, you know, it just seems to make a lot of sense. You know, whether it's good paying jobs we're creating, whether it's protecting the taxpayer, whether we're making sure we have the uh, materials we need to improve Michigan. What are the opponents arguing? If, we, if this has been six years or, or more, in the process, what's stopping it or slowing it down? Why can't it get across the finish line? Well, as Kelly has said, the the I think the, the communities, the the NIMBYisms, the the environment, the um, act, the local community activists that are coming out, that are traveling around, they're stirring up those township meetings. Uh, we see them post, say this is their hobby, this is what they like doing. They don't golf, they don't play sports. What they want to do is to go around to help communities stop mines. Um, so that's truly what has been uh, a big driver in, in doing this. Kelly, on the ground, has this been a political issue from a partisan standpoint? Is that all Republicans or all Democrats on one side or the other? No, it, I, I don't think that it has actually. And I think that that goes to showcase the legislation being bipartisan, is that even the issues are, are bipartisan. I, I work in communities uh, from all different shape, sizes, walks of life. Um, and really, it's the same thing. It, it kind of goes back to this nimbyism. It doesn't matter what your political party is. Mm -hmm. Everybody's got a NIMBY in their, you know, NIMBYism in their community. Yep. Um, but, you know, going back to this point, I just, there's a real uh, challenge here. You know, nobody wants to have control or power taken from them. Mm -hmm. I mean, that that really is kind of, it. it's, it's human Build your nature. Feet dumb, you're yeah, there. I mean, you nobody want wants that taken away. I, I, can, uh, I can understand that. But there's not a domino effect to be had here. And I think that's what some of the opponents will say. Well, if one thing is taken away from the local unit, now we might start this this spiral effect of all other, you know, approval processes being taken away. But I think this particular legislation and mining in general um, is so specific that I just don't think that's a fair comparison. We're talking about something that is, is so unique, is so scientific, that requires a, a significant amount of hydrologic studies and soil borings, such detailed information that really exceed the knowledge and capacity of a lot of these local planning commissioners. It almost feels like why put a burden on these local units if they don't understand the details of what this takes to approve this, put it in the hands of Eagle, who has those literal scientists on their employ to, to be reviewing these processes. Exactly. It seems to be a much better way to get to a good decision is have people who are not only empowered, but have the skill set and have the resources and information to make a logical decision. It sounds like a lot of the opponents, they kind of phrase their opposition on environmental standards. Does the legislation that's out there, are there specific standards in the legislation or does it leave it up to somebody sitting in an office in Eagle here in Lansing to decide up or down what's going on? No, uh, th this bill uh, certainly does. First of all, it 
it does maintain all of the environmental protections that are in place right now. And it actually goes further and enhances them. Uh, there are a number of provisions put in the bill that requires that topsoil um, have a topsoil conservation plan so that it is not stored. And over time, the microorganisms um, die off, that at least it can be a viable uh, place to, or a, a resource into the future. Uh, we're also continuing to compromise uh, with uh, many different parties throughout this uh, process. And there's gonna be a, a wildlife conservation plan that's gonna be required. Uh, there's gonna be a requirement that if the environmental impact statement um, has shows that there's an impact to potential groundwater that we have to monitor it. So uh, people the with elevation. concerns, their voice yep. is being heard. They are being heard. So throughout this process, we've had many stakeholders uh, that have offered uh, thoughts, suggestions. There's been a, a good collaboration throughout this. We have compromised a, a, a whole bunch. Um, our industry right now, we I, I like to say we're kind of like a turtle. Um, we're trying really hard <laughs> to, to get moving, but we're on our back. And in, in order to continue to move our state forward and to continue to improve our infrastructure, we have to get access to this material in order for us to continue to grow. Well, it sounds like for the better betterment of Michigan, we got to get you flipped off your shell. We got to get yes. you moving forward. We got to make sure taxpayers are protected, the environment protected, but that we have good paying jobs and the resources we need to improve Michigan's infrastructure because that's going to benefit all of us. Yes. Yep. Now we're coming down to. Uh, kind of running out of time. What's one or two things that we haven't covered yet that you think our listeners should know about this issue? Obviously it's very complex, but I wanna make sure I give you the last word. I, I want to kind of tag off of the environmental um, issues, if you will, and, and say that there's been a lot of conjecture that's been made about how it doesn't protect certain features of the land. Um, and I think what we failed to do yet, or, or anybody I've seen, you know, it, Gold School, put together a little Excel spreadsheet, which yeah. is what I did, you know, compare this bill to the local units that I work in. Mm -hmm. And so after doing that, I can confidently say that this bill actually has equal or, or greater measures in place than any of the local units um, do that I currently work in. So I think once you actually look at the boots on the ground, how will this operate? Yeah. How will it be effective? What I'm seeing is that it will actually be more effective than the communities that I'm working in. That's real. That's you know. That's real information that we can take um, to folks to, in my opinion, calm some nerves and, and provide some confirmation that this is not here to just bolster a certain industry. This truly has a lot of uh, measures in place to protect the environment, people, residents, local communities. Yep, so step back from emotion, put down your partisanship, and actually look at data yes. and figure out what the best decision is. Exactly. Doug, well, any last thought for you? Well, I just want to certainly thank the, uh, the, the bill sponsors, Representative Whitwer, Representative Car Tyrone Carter, and Representative Altman uh, for their leadership on this. Um, we certainly knew this is this is a tough issue, uh, one that certainly needs to be addressed, one that the state uh, is is feeling the impact on. It is impacting our ability to deliver construction cost pro or construction projects at adequate cost. Um, so we need to get this solved, and, and we appreciate the bipartisanship support that we have in the legislature and the opportunity to share our thoughts with you. Well, we appreciate you being here. Let's hope our, our legislators and the governor can get to work on this and make sure it, it's passed to benefit everybody. It's certainly a complex topic. I appreciate both of you coming in today. A big thanks to Doug and Kelly for sharing their time, their insights, and for all of you for listening. Make sure to tune in to our next episode. Subscribe to our podcast for easy notifications. And until the next episode, let's please make sure we're all working together to move Michigan forward.